Hello everyone, I'm Paul and today I'm going to be talking about boomerang attacks. So more precisely, I'll present a joint work with Amit Bouquerou, Virginie Lallemand, Bimal Mendel and Marine Minier, which introduced the FISTO counterpart of the boomerang connectivity table. So let's get to it. Alright, so I'll start by recalling some basic notions of boomerang attacks. We'll have a look at the boomerang connectivity table, which was introduced for SPNs to study a boomerang switch of one round. Then I'll present the FBCT, so the FISTO counterpart, um, and I'll give some of its properties, uh, compare them with what we know of the BCT. Then um, we'll address the cases where the boomerang switch covers multiple rounds. All right, so boomerang attacks, they date back to 1999. They were introduced by David Wagner and they are a variant of differential cryptanalysis, but instead of considering pairs of messages, here you are looking at um, quartets of messages, and what is studied here is uh, if a difference will come back or not. So let me explain. In the basic form of the distinguisher, as an attacker you have access to encryption and decryption oracles, and what you're going to do is, uh, first, choose M0, use E, your block cipher, to obtain the corresponding ciphertext C0. Then, uh, you're going to construct M1, which is the initial plain text M0 XOR with a difference alpha, and you're going to get C1. Now, two additional ciphertexts C2 and C3 are then computed by adding a difference delta to C0 and C1, and the corresponding plain text M2 and M3 are retrieved. So finally, what we want to do is check if M2 and M3 differ by the same value alpha. Now if the probability that the difference equals alpha is higher than uh, for a random permutation, then we have a distinguisher. So boomerang attacks uh, have an advantage over standard differential attacks, um, which is that they remain efficient as long as there exist short, high probability differential characteristics. Um, so, I mean on a small number of rounds. So you don't need a high probability differential on the whole cipher. Usually you would use two small differentials covering half of the attack rounds each. Uh, so for instance, in the original approach, the attack cipher E is written as the composition of two subciphers E0 and E1. And you need good differentials over each part. So let's say that for E0, the input difference alpha leads to the output difference beta with high probability P, and uh, gamma leads to delta with probability Q over E1. Then it was thought that with probability P square Q square, the boomerang came back. Now, this formula was uh, later questioned because some odd cases were observed. Um, so in some cases, the boomerang would come back more often uh, for instance, in the uh, related key cryptanalysis of the AES, Birkhoff and Krovatovich found distinguishers with probability higher than expected. They also identified some particular cases that they called the ladder switch, the S-box switch, and the FISO switch. Um, and sometimes the boomerang didn't come back at all. Um, so that's what Murphy showed. He um, he exhibited an example of distinguisher that seemed valid, but was in fact of probability zero. So people realized that the junction of the two trails needed to be studied more carefully, and all these observations were later formalized in a framework called the sandwich attack. Now in this setting, the cipher is divided into three parts instead of two. So E0 and E1 are still here, but in between there is a middle part, EM, called the boomerang switch. Now if EM satisfied the requested differential propagation among the vortex with probability R, then the probability of the boomerang distinguisher is P square Q square R. So usually R would be manually computed by looking at the equations linking E0 and E1. But then at Eurocrypt 2018, a new tool was introduced to easily evaluate the probability of the middle part for SPNs in the case where it covers one round. This tool was called the Boomerang Connectivity Table, or BCT for short. So what's interesting about this technique is that it reduces the problem of computing the probability R of the boomerang switch over one round function to the one of computing it over one S-box only. 
So here's our middle switch, and we want the returning difference to be equal to beta. Um, so if we just expand EM and write it as an SPN, we get the following. Um, now looking at the S-box level, from beta and gamma, it's easy to deduce intermediate input-output values um, that we're going to call delta I and nabla O for each S-box, which gives us the following equation. So now this study is simplified. Instead of looking at the property of a round as a whole, the problem is reduced to one we can easily study because of its small size. That is, examining each S-box of the S-layer independently. And now since the S-boxes are applied in parallel, the probability over one round is simply going to be the product of the probabilities over each S-box. So here's the BCC table for um, the small S box of Skinny for Skinny64. Um, so as you can see, the BCT of an S box is going to give at row delta i nabla o the number of values for which a boomerang of input delta i and output difference nabla o comes back. Now from this, the probability of a boomerang switch over each S box can be deduced then the probability R that a message verifies the entire EM step can be computed. So this tool gave a new criterion for the choice of S-boxes, because naturally, an S-box with small BCT coefficients is going to prevent an attacker from building efficient boomerang-style attacks. It also gave a better understanding of the special cases observed by Murphy or Berukov. So it detects cases where the boomerang won't come back, and these are the zeros in your table. It also detects um, so the ladder switch, which is one of the special cases observed by Biryukov and Kovatovich in their related key analysis of the AES. So without going into uh, the details of it, um, we can read this on the first row or the first column of um, the BCT. All right, so from what we've seen, the BCT is a very convenient tool uh, to automatically study the behavior of the junction between E0 and E1. Um, however, there exists no such tool for uh, boomerang attacks on Feistel networks. Um, so we address this in the next part uh, by introducing the FBCT, uh, the Feistel counterpart of the BCT. And as we're about to see, the boomerang behavior of an S-box in the FISO case can be quite different from the SPN case. And but first, let's just define our table. Um, so we start by illustrating our theory on the generic FISO, but it also works for variants of this construction, like the type 1 and type 2. All right, so that's our switch. And um, so for the sake of clarity, we're going to number our states just like that. Um, so here we consider balanced Feistel with two branches and a Feistel function f, which is defined by a round key addition, an s layer, and a linear layer l. So at this stage, we will not focus on the details of f. Um, the only import important thing is that f contains one s layer made by the concatenation of t and bit s boxes. Um, so we are interested in the probability of the following one round boomerang switch. We have an input difference equal to beta between state 1 and 2, and an output difference equal to gamma between state 1 and 3, and between state 2 and 4. And we want the input between state 3 and 4 to be equal to beta. Um, so since we're going to study the left and right part, we can just uh, separate the differences into two parts. Um, just like that, let's just split them. Same for the output. All right, so um, let's start by studying the cost of um, obtaining the left difference between state three and four. Um, so we want beta L, and uh, the good thing is the left branch is the one that is not modified through one round of Feistel. So the left part actually comes for free. All right, so moving on to the right part now, um, we want to obtain a difference of beta r between the right part of state 3 and 4. Um, so let's just call these branches r prime and r second. Um, so I'll go through this pretty quickly, the details are in the paper anyway, but um, basically it's just a matter of writing down the differences we have at each branch. Um, so right, so this is what we want, 
um, and by naming L prime and L second the left outputs after one round in state three and four, um, then we get the following equations. So here I've replaced R prime, and I can do the same thing for R second. Um, and then we express L and L second as functions of LR, the two branches of state one, and the differences. And we get this. We can simplify a bit. Um, and so in the end, we end up with the following condition. Uh, this entire thing right there needs to be equal to zero. All right, so now we have this condition on the entire round function. But now what we can do is that we can use the fact that the nonlinear function of f is an s layer that is simply a parallel application of small s boxes. Um, so meaning that we can rewrite um, this condition as a set of independent, co independent conditions on smaller parts of the states and obtain uh, equations of this form. Uh, so here delta i is the difference at the input of the S box between state 1 and 2. It can be deduced from beta L. And nabla O is the difference at the input of the S box between state 1 and 3 and states 2 and 4. And it can be deduced from gamma R. So interestingly, what we're looking at here is uh, actually the uh, second derivative of S uh, cancelling out. Right, so with that, we can now define our FBCT. Uh, so the FBCT is going to be a table uh, in which the entry for the delta i and nabla o position is given by the number of times the second derivative of s cancels out in this point. And once the table is built, the probability that a boomerang comes back over one round of a Feistel scheme is simply going to be the product of the corresponding coefficients uh, divided by 2 to the power of n. So that's just like um, in the SPN case. Here you're looking at the um, FBCT of one of the S boxes used in um, L block. Alright, so now some uh, simple properties that are uh, easily deduced from the definition of the FBCT. Um, so it's uh, symmetrical. The input and output difference can be permuted. The diagonal is always going to be equal to 2 to the power of n. Um, the value of um, the FBCT is always going to be a multiple of 4, and that's simply because if x is solutions, uh, so are xor delta i, xor nabla o, and xor delta i, xor nabla o. And finally, uh, for each row, the values are the same when the column is shifted by the value of the row. Well, let's talk about the Faisal scheme. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the special cases identified by Biryukov and Kovratovich, in which the boomerang comes back for free for a Faisal construction. And this is one uh, excerpt from, from their paper. Um, so the setting is shown on this figure. What we have here is that the left input difference and the right output difference are the same. So those are in green. And using our previous analysis, we know that the internal state xy is going to allow the boomerang to come back if um, this equation is verified, which in this case is go always going to be true because gamma r and beta l are equal. So what happens here is that if we consider the fast round function to be, to be made of some linear operations and an S layer, um, then for every S box, we are actually looking at coefficients that are on the diagonal of the FBCT. So we're seeing here that our table automatically gives the last special case of switch. We also have uh, properties regarding APN functions. So I'll just recall that a function s is called almost perfect nonlinear, or APN, if the derivative of s at delta i has either zero or two solutions for any non-zero delta i. Now when looking at the FBCT of such functions, um, we can say the following. So f is APN if and only if the coefficients of its FBCT equal zero, except in the first row, first column, or first diagonal. Uh, here's an example of a 3-bit S-box. Um, 
So you have the DDT, the FBCT, and the BCT. Um, I think it's actually the one from um, Pyjamas. Now to conclude this part, uh, I will now give a quick comparison of the BCT and the FBCT regarding the boomerang uniformity of an S-box for various classes of equivalents. So the boomerang uniformity is a relevant parameter for an S-box. Um, in an SPN, it's the highest value that is neither on the first row nor the first column. And its uh, properties uh, were already investigated by uh, Christina Bourra and Anne Canto um, about two years ago. Now, uh, for the Feistel scheme, um, the diagonal is also always equal to 2 to the power of n, so we have to exclude these values as well. All right, so here we compared the boomerang uniformity for the affine, extended affine, and CCZ equivalences. Uh, so those are classes um, that tend to preserve some uh, cryptographic properties for uh, equivalent S-boxes. Uh, and what we can see here is that the uh, set composed of all values in the FBCT is preserved under affine and extended affine transformations, but not for CCZ equivalence or for inversion. Uh, so the key point here is that um, a good S-box for an SPN is going to be a good as box for a FISO scheme regarding many usual criteria such as differential, linear, or algebraic degree. However, the behavior can be different regarding boomerang switches if we use it in an SPN or in a FISO. Alright, so in the last part of this talk we're going to focus on boomerang switches over more rounds. Um, so this has already been done for SPN constructions. Um, there are uh, two paper that investigated uh, this, these cases. So for instance, uh, Wang and Perrin introduced the BDT, standing for Boomerang Difference Table, which is a variant of the BCT with an additional variable fixed, um, which is the S-box output difference. Um, so here's the BDT, there's also the BDT prime for um, the invert operation. And so uh, Wang and Perrin propose to use the product of the BDT and BDT prime coefficients to cover the case of a two-round switch. Um, so first you're going to apply the BDT on the S-box layer of the upper round, and then the BDT prime on the lower S-box layer. So in our analysis, we found a similar table for the FISO case. Um, so we introduced the FISO boomerang difference table, the FBDT, which is a three-dimensional array uh, in which the entry for delta i, small delta, nabla o is computed by the formula appearing on the screen. So for a two-round switch, again here we consider a very generic case where the round function is composed of one S-box layer made of t parallel n bit s boxes and of some linear or affine operations. So this implies that if the input difference of one round is known together with the output difference of the s box layer, then uh, the difference at the input of the next round s box layer can be computed. All right, so for instance here, let's look at the um, upper round, so the first round, um, and we're going to focus on the difference between state one and two. Um, so the one uh, in blue. So delta i is going to represent the difference at the input of the first round S-box layer, and um, this value can be deduced from the left input difference of the first round, delta i l. Then um, we have small delta, which denotes the corresponding output difference of the same S-box layer, um, but it's not uh, specified. Then finally, we have delta i prime, which corresponds to the difference at the input of the second S-box layer. So again, uh, with respect to state one and two, and its value can be deduced from delta and from delta i r. Now, in a similar way, um, the difference at the input of the second round S-box layer between state two and four, so now we're looking at the red differences, um, 
So this difference is going to be set to a value that we're going to denote by nabla o, and which can be deduced from the right output difference nabla o r. Then the corresponding output difference is going to be denoted by alpha, but again, we're not going to fix it. And finally, uh, nabla o prime uh, represents the input difference of the first roundness box layer for this state, and it can be computed from nabla ol and alpha. So now, having uh, defined those new uh, variables, the probability that a boomerang comes back over two rounds can be computed by applying the FBDT on the S boxes of the first round and the FBDT on the S boxes of the second round. Then you're going to sum all the probabilities um, over all possible S box outputs. Um, so here, delta and alpha. So sometimes we want to go even further. So uh, let's talk about th three round switches. Um, as depicted in the figure, we introduce new variables to represent all the intermediate differences. And the idea will be to iterate over all the possible values for these, um, compute the probability of the obtained settings, and finally sum together the probabilities, just like we saw for the two-round switch. So for that, we're going to need a new table. That's going to be the FBET, Feistel Boomerang Extended Table, which is a four-dimensional table for which the each entry is going to be computed according to the formula appearing on the screen. Now with this table, the probability of a switch can then be estimated to be the sum over all the possible intermediate differences of the product of the FBAT coefficient for each S-box. Uh, now in this approximation, we consider that the same characteristic is used between state 1 and 2 and between state 3 and 4. So the uh, new table that we've introduced here, the FBET, treats the case of an arbitrary number of rounds and recovers the previous formulas. Uh, the problem is uh, when you're looking at a switch covering many rounds, applying this formula can require too much time if many S boxes are involved. Um, so it might be better to evaluate the probability of EM experimentally. All right, um, so to wrap it up, we have developed a new theory that explains the behavior of boomerang switches for Faisal ciphers. Um, we've introduced the notion of FBCT, and we gave its main properties and relations with other well-known cryptographic tables. And we saw that it could uh, easily evaluate the probability of a one-round switch. We also provided a, an expression of the probability of a boomerang switch over two rounds, and gave a more general expression of the one over multiple rounds. But this leads to many parameters, so switching to experiments to evaluate the probability might be better. Um, thank you for your attention, and if you have um, any questions, um, I will see you at the live session.